This is the Anything Goes Project video stream. Please be patient. The show will begin momentarily. Remember, the show can be reached via email at stalkermailbox at gmail.com or simply call in and leave us a voicemail at 361-433-5739. If you like the show, please subscribe and leave us a rating. This helps the show to be seen. More video streams can be found on the Anything Goes Project YouTube channel. To help the show, subscribe and like the channel. The Anything Goes Project can be found on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Castbox, Stitcher Radio, or anywhere you get your podcast media from. <laughs> You're listening to the Anything Goes Project. Interesting topics, interesting things, real stories by real people. Your host is Mike. The Anything Goes Project is a production of MMC Designs. Be advised, this show may not be suitable for all ages. Many of the topics are for mature audiences only. The explicit tag is there for a reason. If you would like to contact the show, email us at stalkermailbox at gmail.com or leave us a message at 361-433-5739. And now, on with the show. Good evening, everybody. This is Mike with the Anything Goes Project. And tonight, I have an awesome guest with uh, for you. We're going to be discussing gratitude. The episode you got last week was with Amy, and she talked about gratitude and glamour. Well, tonight, I've got another guest who's also going to be bringing the topic of gratitude. So Scott Colby. In the summer of 2014, Scott Colby took a trip to Guatemala to help build schools with Hug It Forward. That would change his life forever. During this time in Guatemala, he came close, he became close with families and students and parents and was shocked by their overall positive demeanor. Each family came from a place of struggle, having little access to clean water, not much food, and living in small, run-down, single-room homes. However, their attitude towards life seemed to emphasize gratitude, graciousness, and lacked the common negativity or the grass is always greener on mindset. So with that, I want to bring in Scott. I mean, that's awesome that you actually got to go to Guatemala and help with these people. And yes, you see a whole new mindset in this. Oh my gosh, you're right. First of all, thank you, Mike, for having me. Thank you to your viewers and listeners for tuning in. <laughs> I appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, that trip to Guatemala, I've been there twice now. So that summer of 2014 was my first trip there. And it was just so eye-opening. You know, I went to do some volunteer work. Like you mentioned, I was helping to build schools. And I went because I wanted to serve. And But I knew I was going to get something out of it, right? Uh, oftentimes, we volunteer to make we ourselves get that feel good. good. Yeah, we get that feel good. But I didn't know how much my life would actually change after that trip. Um, because, you know, our attitudes here where we live just seem completely different than over there in Guatemala. And to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. You know, here I am going to a third world country for the very first time. I, I didn't speak the language there. Mm -hmm. All I knew was I was going to help. And I didn't know how would we would be received. And the really cool thing, Mike, was... I was riding a bus from where we were staying in the hotel uh, about 90 minutes to our school build site. And I was sitting with about 25 other volunteers and the road was really poor conditions. The bus was bouncing oh, yeah. up and down. And uh, I didn't know any of the other volunteers. I had just met them at dinner the night before. And so, you know, I was collecting my thoughts in my head and just thinking about what am I going to see here and you know when you try something new you often are just trying to picture what's about to happen yeah and a lot of times what's about to happen isn't what really happens and it was really interesting as the bus pulled up to the community site where we we're going to build the school I was completely shocked because 
it felt like the entire community had come out to greet the volunteers. And so they had formed two lines from right where the bus pulled up. They formed two lines about 100 yards back. And as we, the volunteers, got off the bus, we were walking between the two lines of people, almost like we were on the red carpet or mm -hmm. rock stars. And that the way they treated us with open arms, they were waving the American flag, they were playing music, uh, they were giving us hugs and high fives. And this felt really good to me. I was like, there was my first moment um, experience in this community. I was like, what a welcome. I mean, I couldn't imagine any better welcome. Yeah. Now, as I reflect on it, what I think to myself, and I, and I talk a lot about this when I talk to organizations, is how come I don't feel this outpouring of love and support in my own hometown? You know, I feel it in a third world country. Strangers are welcoming me and with open arms, with kindness and smiles and love and gratitude. But yet here where I live and where many people live in the U.S. or other countries, we may not feel that in our own home city. Or where even we our might own pass, home. In our own home, where we might pass somebody on the sidewalk and we want to make eye contact and smile and say hello. And they're maybe looking straight ahead like they don't want to make that connection with you. And a lot of times it's due to this. It's because they're on their smartphones and there's so much technology now and we're glued to our technology 24 seven. And I think we are able to connect in more ways than ever before, but that doesn't equal deep connection that I was feeling in Guatemala right away. And so it was just interesting from that very first moment of my volunteer experience, how welcome and connected to the community I think community is another word I like to talk about. I felt a strong sense of community there that even I don't often feel where I live. And so yeah. it's a really cool moment. Uh, it's different when you're, when you are going to a third world country because you're actually, I think we take for granted a lot of things in our lives. Uh, I did an interview a while back with uh, my karate sensei and he's originally from Mexico city. And we were talking about the differences between children growing up in a third world country and the children growing up in America. Hmm. I mean, pretty much every, we take for granted the clothes on our backs, the clean water that we've got to drink, the fact that we're going to have a hot meal mm -hmm. each evening. Mm -hmm. And you're going to this country to build something for them that we definitely take for granted. A school. All of our kids are like, I don't want to go to school. Yes. And their kids are like, we're going to have a school. Yes, you got it. And that's, um, that's really what I noticed there. I mean, you hit on all those. Like, you know, I actually asked one of the kids there on the very last day, like, she came running to me and gave me a big hug. It was our last day. And I asked her, like, what are you thankful for in all this? And uh, she, you know, she didn't say, like things like cell phone, you know, things that they don't have, right? Video right. games and all that stuff. She said, I'm grateful for my new classroom. I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for you and, and all the volunteers. And those were the things that were touching them in the moment. And uh, they just had big smiles on their faces. And like you said, they're living in really poor conditions, not much clean water, not much food. Their parents don't make much money. They're sleeping on the floor. It's dirty. The classrooms that they did have were cramped. So they did have a classroom. Oh, yeah. But you're also in those classrooms. They're cramming in kids of all ages into yes. one class. And they're just teaching one class. So you yeah. may be going over the ABCs. And the kid who's 14 years old is like, I know these. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or have you been to a third world country? Like yes, this? I have. Okay. Uh, Where have you my, been? my wife, uh, her uncle is actually from uh, Honduras. Oh, okay. It's uh, her, uh, her aunt's husband. She married, uh, she met him and ended up getting married to him while she was on a trip, uh, a service trip down to Honduras. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. And w the cool thing about this volunteer trip or one of the other cool things were some of the volunteers that I went with 
had kids and they brought their kids. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether they were teenagers, I think the youngest kid was 10 from America that volunteered, but there was a few teenagers. Man, what an experience. I wish every kid had the opportunity to have that experience because that can completely change your perspective on being on being grateful at such an early age. And I I do want to say this for anybody who is listening, you don't have to go to a third world country to experience this gratitude Mm -hmm. and to experience the joy that you can get from actually doing something like this. A lot of it here locally. Yeah. My wife took a group of uh, teenagers to Philadelphia from Texas to go into the roughest part of Philadelphia because there was four houses there that needed repair. Mm. They were for an elderly families and they just couldn't do the repairs themselves. And uh, so we were given told about them and we were like, okay, great. We took an entire, um, or I didn't actually go on this one cause I was doing, I was on another job. My wife took them on this one though. And they went in and like built new decks, porches, re-roofed a house, and the kids learned so much from this because they got to see a different side of life. I mean, here they are. They're getting to sit at home all cushy with their Xboxes and their phones and everything and getting to chill out. And now they're going to a house that when they walk in, it's like, oh, crap, I can see the sky in, in this house. <laughs> right. And the families were so thankful for it. Even the police department, they came in actually because it was such a rough neighborhood. They said they actually stationed a police officer at each one of the houses just to oh, make wow. sure. But the police officers were like, we've never had somebody come into this neighborhood and just come in, offer the help and the service and not ask for anything in return. Mm. That's, yeah, that's incredible. And you, you make a great point. You don't have to leave the country. There's a lot of needs in your own community, mm-hmm. probably. Um, and I love the idea of getting the kids involved. Uh, and I've spoken a little bit uh, to a few schools on gratitude. And I love bringing that message out to kids because I think, you know, I'm in my forties and school for me was a long time ago and oh, yeah. it's much different now. Right. There's uh, so I don't many, think you could pay me to go back to school now. Oh, I um, mean, kids have it so rough these days and there's social media and there's bullying and there's online cyber bullying and anxiety and depression. It's just mm-hmm. a whole lot of, uh, issues going on with kids these days. And I think messages like gratitude and connection can really shift a kid's perspective if they start to really take it to heart and live in it. And I think giving back and volunteering in some capacity can really open your eyes up to a whole new world. Oh, yeah. And any listeners, you want to start connecting? First thing you can do to start connecting, start having dinners together and don't let these at the table. Love it. Yeah. I mean, that would bring me back to how I had family dinners, right? Of course, Mm -hmm. phones, cell phones like this weren't invented yet, but I remember, uh, my, Blackberry. (laughs) yeah, my dad used to take, when we, we would have family dinner. So we did do that. And my dad would take the phone off the hook. So people would get a busy signal and not interrupt our dinner. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And here's, If we're speaking about busy signals, I made fun of my parents the other day on Facebook. I don't think they saw it. They're on Facebook, but they didn't see this post or they didn't comment on it. But they just celebrated their 52nd anniversary. And I called them. They're in Virginia and I'm in Colorado. I called them to wish them a happy anniversary. And I got a busy signal. They were one of the few that never... How do you get a busy signal in today's society? (laughs) They still have a landline, but they were one of the few that never got a call waiting. I'm like... People are oh. probably like, what's this noise? Yep, a busy signal, guys. That's doing. when you call all the kids in. Guys, come here, listen to this. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so kind of funny. But yeah, I love your idea of just bringing the family together together over mealtime. And, and a lot of times, that's where it starts. <clears throat> you bring the family together. That's where you have the, that's where you have the conversation. And you can dig deep into these topics like that about serving and helping people and that you know the world is not all about me it's not all about you but as a whole what can we do for humanity Mm -hmm. i mean there are people in this world that have nothing 
and my kids, uh, they didn't actually, and I didn't even tell them I did this. I told my, my, my wife and I were talking about it one day and I said something about it. And she's like, Oh, I didn't know you did that. We were, I was in town one day and I happened to, I was driving through town and I just happened to notice over off to the side, there was an, one of our old abandoned buildings that's there. There was a couple of guys sitting there and they had bicycles there and they had like the grocery bags all over it and stuff like that. You could tell these guys that I had never seen them in town. They were just moving through town, but they were homeless hmm. and they were just sitting there. It was a hot day and they were under the awning, just chilling out and just fanning themselves. I was like, and just something struck me. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do something. Pulled into McDonald's, went over there, bought a couple of meals, a couple of drinks, a few bottles of water turned around and went back over there and I walked up and they were like, Oh, we're sorry, sir. We're going to, we're going to leave. We're going to leave. Mm. I said, no, man, I'm not here to run you off. Bring you lunch. That's awesome. And they were like, what? And I said, yeah, I saw y'all over here. Figured you were hot or something. Use a cold drink, maybe something to eat with it. So here you go. And they were, and they told me at that point, they said, usually when we see somebody coming up like that, it's like, they're telling us we're trespassing and we need to leave. Mm. And I was like, nah, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to just offer you a lunch and a cold drink. And to tell you, have a great day. Awesome. Got back in my truck and carried on. You know, because home, homeless people are just like us, right? We mm -hmm. have basic human emotions. We want to feel seen. We want to feel acknowledged. We want to feel a sense of belonging, community. We all want those things. And it's so great what you did. Back to the dinner, I was reading a book, um, the Life is Good book. So you may know the brand, Life is Good. Mm -hmm. And the, the founders wrote a book a couple years ago, um, which I really enjoyed. And, and they recalled a story when they were kids, the founders of Life is Good, when they were kids, they would sit around the dinner table and the mom would, before they ate anything, the mom would say, tell me something good. And they would go around the dinner table and they would have to say something good in their lives. And so instead of complaining, uh, you, know, so, mm -hmm. you know, something bad happened in school or I hated all this homework they would have to think of something positive in their life for that day. And they would go around the room or around the dinner table and express that. And that's great. If you can bring the family together and express gratitude around the dinner table, that's a great way to get your kids involved at an early age. Um, just thinking about the good that they have. I've brought that type of topic up before to my kids several <laughs> times. It's like, they'll be complaining about this and this. And I'm like, well, you know, you're complaining about that, but, Look at all what you have. Are you not grateful for the fact that you have a bed to sleep in tonight? Yes. <laughs> and you know what? My uh, bring you remind me of something. Adults need this too, right? Oh, and yeah. uh, one of my colleagues and friends, I interviewed him uh, for a project I was doing. Kevin Clayson. He wrote a book called "Flipping the Gratitude Switch," and he talks about finding the awesome in negative situations. It could be something big. It could be something minor. And a good, a good example is like, okay, you're stuck in traffic. Everybody's probably been stuck in traffic. And you, oh, yeah. You hate to be stuck in traffic, and especially if it's going to make you late to work or to an appointment. And your first emotions are anxiety, anger, maybe a little road rage or whatever the case may be. Well, Kevin suggests, okay, try to find the awesome in being stuck in traffic. What's the good in it? And you might think, like, there's nothing awesome about being stuck in traffic. Until you really think, oh, I'm in a car. It's 100 degrees out. I'm in a car with air conditioning. Many people have to walk everywhere. They may have to take public transportation to work. Yep. At least I have a car. Oh, wait, I'm driving to work. I have a job. The job provides food for my family and a roof over my head and clothes on my back. Not everybody has a job. You mentioned some people are homeless. Maybe they're unemployed and they don't have a home. So at least I have a job and I'm grateful. Maybe in the car is a loved one and you get to spend 15 extra minutes with them mm -hmm. because you are stuck in traffic and you can really connect with them in a more deeper, intimate way. And so start to think about those things, shift your perspective on things that seem to be negative in your life and see where you can find the awesome in those things. Yeah, or do like I do, just record a show. <laughs> yeah, right? And, uh, I've done that before, be a lot stuck in traffic, and I'm like, I have an idea. Hit record. <laughs> I'll edit this That's when awesome. I get home. <laughs> I love that idea. And I'm sure whatever you're recording is something positive.
Well, I, I did a I did a whole series called The Drive Time, and it was basically me in the morning, on my morning drive, thoughts that I had, things that were going through my head, and I did a whole series on attitude. And I don't know if you've ever read anything by John C. Maxwell. Yes. And it was going over the uh, seven axioms of attitude. Okay. And I did that over a two week period every morning. Talk about like, today's axiom is, uh, or is, or the truth of attitude, because we have the truths of attitude and the axioms of attitude. And we were talking about like identifying, you can identify those people that are, that have the attitude of complaining mm. and how we can counter that and stuff like that. So that's what I did for like two weeks, just driving oh, to God. work every morning. Yeah. Who cares if you're stuck in traffic? More I've had people contact, uh, send me an email and they're like, why don't you do the drive time show anymore? And I was like, cause you wouldn't be able to hear it. And they're like, what? I said, I'm on a motorcycle right now. <laughs> and they were like, well, what happened to your vehicle? I said, my wife's got it. <laughs> I'm taking my bike. That'd be, an, un- that'd be an unusual uh, recording. On a oh, bike I recorded sure. something on it j- just be- for one person that I know in person that actually comes up to me all the time. You need to start recording. I'm like, I push play and I said, <laughs> here we go. And he was like, it sounds like wind. I said, I'm talking. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, but that was something that I was doing. I mean, like I said, it's summertime. I'm riding my bike. So drive time got put on hold for now. (laughs) Well, when you bring it back, let me know and I'll tune in. It, it it seemed to do pretty good. Uh, It's just, man, that was, that was rough to have to come up with something every day for a podcast. Right. So I was like, okay, motorcycle. Good. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. But I was thankful for the fact that I could actually do it. Yeah. There's a lot of people who can't do that. Right. So, yeah. I mean, work. You're doing a lot of work with gratitude. And you're talking to businesses and organizations and companies on gratitude. So I'm curious how you actually play this into a business model, too. Because people, uh, companies a lot of time don't have that gratitude type mentality Mm -hmm. it's 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 a numbers game for them and for anybody watching on the show you see my blue fingers here yeah i tried to break my fingers yesterday i was wondering what that was (laughs) yeah i had them taped together today well messed them up really good i hope you're right i got i'm I'm grateful that they're still there (laughs) yeah right so Um, yeah so bring this offering up gratitude and talking to businesses and organizations about gratitude. I'm not, I, I realize how you would do it with the, with a group of school kids. Cause you're going to, sure. you're going to share these stories, but businesses, they want to see numbers. Yep. Awesome. Great question. So there's a couple different routes to go with businesses. Um, and I've been speaking a lot at conferences in um, for state healthcare associations. So a lot of people that work as caregivers and they work at, um, at a assisted living places, but really gratitude can be incorporated in any type of business. So here's one approach and one thing that I speak on. And this stems back from when I first was in the working world. So I wasn't always a business owner. I graduated from college and I got a research position in Vail, Colorado uh, at a sports medicine clinic. And what I remember, Mike, my, so this is my first job out of college. And I remember my 90 day review and I'm like, okay, what's going to happen here? Kind of like riding that bus to the community in Guatemala. I didn't know what to expect. And so as I go into my supervisor's office, uh, shut the door behind me, sat down at the desk across from him and he had already filled out this uh, form. So he had Mm pre-filled out everything. And I was like, I'm not sure what he's going to say. I was a little bit nervous. And he proceeded to kind of list everything that I could be doing better or that I wasn't doing the right way or whatever the case may be. And not once did he say, we're so thankful that you're part of the company. It's been a great three months. Here's what you're doing well. Here's what you need to improve on. It was kind of all the negative stuff. And when I left his office, and you know, I left his office feeling a little bit defeated. Um, My shoulders were slumped, my head was down. And I remember having this exact thought, because this was my first job and I was calculating like, 
okay, I'm going to be in the working world to about 65, I guess 65 is retirement age, or at least it was when I was thinking about it then. I was like, I don't, I don't know now. I think I'm going to be working forever now, but as entrepreneurs, we kind of have to, but I started to think about like, I can't, I can't go through 40 years of feeling like I'm not good enough, essentially. And it may, it was the first, my first thoughts of like, I think eventually I'm going to have to run my own show. But as I've done research recently, I now know that my feeling back then, way back with my first job, I'm not alone. And I um, have spoken to the author of this book. There's a book called The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace. It's a offshoot of the five love languages for personal relationships. There's five languages of appreciation in the workplace. And I've spoken to the author of that book. And uh, what I've learned from him is 79% of people that leave a job do so not because they want to get paid more or some other reason like that. It's because they don't feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. We talked about those emotions that all humans want. We want to feel appreciated and acknowledged and valued and heard. And about 79% of people that leave a job don't feel this way. Yeah. And um, what that leads to for an organization is a lot of wasted money because it costs money to uh, have to hire new people. First of all, have to search for a new replacement, have to hire somebody, train them. Um, and so staff turnover is a big expense for organizations. So when you can learn how to appreciate your people, your team in their language, and so each of us has a language that we prefer to be appreciated, when we can learn to do that as a company, our team's going to perform better, we're gonna be happier, there's gonna be better company morale, and they're gonna stay longer, so it yields a net savings, an overall cost savings in your company. So that's some of what I, talk about yeah. um, and then really kind of the other direction I go is how to show your clients and customers gratitude so they will stay with you longer and refer more people to you and that yields more money as well and so one of the simplest ways I talk about this all the time is uh, just sending handwritten notes because they're kind of a lost art especially in this digital world and that we don't you touched yeah. on something right there uh my uh i i've bought my truck i've bought i've bought a truck from this same dealership mm. every time i've gone back and of course i drive my trucks till they fall apart mm -hmm. i bought uh two uh two uh uh a 1998 ford f-150 i traded it in in 2013 Wow. <laughs> you got your money's worth. Got my money's worth to the same guy that sold it to me. I oh, went there beautiful. and got a new vehicle, a new truck, but it never fails. All 20 years of that. He sends me every year on my birthday, a handwritten happy birthday. We're thinking of you here at the Ford dealership. My first car, my first car I got, the saleswoman sent me birthday cards. Yeah. And it makes a difference. You're like, I want to go back. And that's, and that's exactly what I did. When it came time for me to get a new truck, I picked up the phone and I called the dealership and I said, Hey, I need to speak to Felipe. Mm. And I, he answered the phone and he goes, I said, Hey, this is Mike Simon. He goes, yeah, I remember you sold you that <laughs> Ford back in 98. Are you finally ready to get rid of it? Oh my gosh. That's awesome. And I said, yes, I am. And he goes, what are you wanting? I said, another truck. And he goes, come on down. I've got some for you to look at. I'll have them mm. pulled out and ready. Yeah. He made that personal connection. Yep. I love that. Yeah. Did the and same that, thing whenever my wife needed a new car, I called him up and said, Hey, my wife's car just got totaled out. I need a new one. Okay. Uh, what is it like? And I told him, got to the dealership. He already had them lined up. Pick which one you like. Love it. And I love that you brought up the example of a, a car dealership because the most famous example of a business using handwritten notes to build their business was a car salesman by the name of Joe Girard. And he was, um, he's actually in the Guinness Book of World Records as the greatest salesman. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I have a list of stats. I only remember one off the top of my head. In 14 years of selling cars, 
he, he sold 13,001 cars in 14 years. And what he did was actually, he wrote handwritten notes, or he and his team, so he had a big team, wrote handwritten notes to his customers like you every single month. So not just birthday, he did every single month just so that whenever the month came that you did need a car or a new truck, you would be fresh on their mind. Fresh on their mind. And so he got to the point where he was writing, or his team was writing thousands of cards per month, but it was the system, it was the thing he did to get people coming back to him. And that's what you can do as a business owner is write handwritten notes uh, and on a consistent basis. And you're going to get not only uh, people coming back to you, they're going to refer their friends to you. Yeah, Um, not necessarily even handwritten notes. Uh, We're living in an age of technology right now. mm -hmm. And I've got people that I've connected with throughout the years on Facebook. And some of them have become really good friends and they're people that I've interviewed and people that I've connected with in men's groups and on dad's groups and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes the best thing in the world that you can do is just send them a quick message. Hey man, you were on my mind today. Mm -hmm. Just want to check in with you and see how you're doing. I hope everything's going good. That's all you need. But it shows that person that you appreciate them and that you were, you were actually thinking of them. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I make it a habit. If somebody, if I'm sitting there thinking about something and uh, somebody pops into my head, it's like, oh, I'll stop real quick and send them a quick message, whether it's by text, messenger, or whatever. And one of the, and we've actually had this discussion uh, in the uh, Gentleman's Brotherhood group. I don't know if you've heard that one on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Juan Sepulveda, he's the uh, leader of the group. He's the one that actually started it. And I had him on the show. And the, 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 the topic of that is how to be a gentleman. And that was one of the topics we discussed. He's like, you know, if somebody's on your mind, tell them. Yeah. Let them know. It, because that lets them know that they matter. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. And you're not like contacting them for a favor. Yeah. You're making that personal connection. You're deepening the relationship. Um, one of the things I've started to do, you know how like uh, Facebook notifies you when it's your Facebook friend's birthday. Right. If you're writing a birthday message on their timeline, it's getting mixed in with like, 500 other messages that they're getting. Of course, you could send them a handwritten note or pick up the phone and call them. But what I've been doing through Facebook Messenger is just you can record a quick video or a quick audio. Mm-hmm. Send them that direct message, send them an audio or video because it adds a little bit of a personal touch. Then your happy birthday is going to stand out amongst the other 500 that they're getting. They're going to really and receive it. Does. it. I yeah, got a, uh, a happy birthday from my boss of all people he sent me a happy birthday one year in klingon <laughs> nice and, like, and you remember you're talking you're talking about it today yeah, on the podcast. that was eight years ago he sent that yeah. and still we're talking about it now but yeah that was i guess he finally figured out hey you can send audio with this so he actually <laughs> captured a little audio clip that he found online of klingon singing happy birthday <laughs> that's awesome but yeah and i'll drop like you said messenger's awesome for that because you can short you can record a little quick 60 second Mm -hmm. and you don't even have to sit there and worry about typing or anything you can be driving in your car just reach over and hit the button you don't even have to do anything just talk hey just want to check in with you see how you're doing you were on my mind today boom there we go it's so easy to do but it makes like there's so many people that feel alone right? Mm-hmm. Maybe what, for whatever reason, I know as entrepreneurs, you know, working alone, working from home, it can be isolating. If somebody sends me a little short audio, just thinking of you, hope all is well, do you need anything? I'm going to be, re- I'm going to remember that for years. It, it makes, makes you golden for the day. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's incredible what that does. And really when it, what it boils on, down to in a business setting, we're talking about gratitude in the business setting. What it boils down to is treating people like people, like humans, not like a transaction, not like a dollar sign, 
treating them like somebody with real feelings and showing them that you care. And one of my favorite examples for me on a personal note, um, as far as a business that leads with gratitude, I go to a coffee shop uh, almost every day. And there's a coffee shop here in Denver. So that's where I live in the Denver area. And I've been going to them since 2011, since 2019 as we record this. And so first of all, I don't want to think about how much money I've spent on them because that's a lot of money I've spent in cafe au lait's um, when I know I can be Cash making up. You can get a dollar off every time you go. <laughs> I like it. Um, but I, the reason I keep going back is because they feel like family to me. They've gotten to mm -hmm. know me on a really personal level. And so just a couple of examples, their owner, Jeff, I've gotten to know their owner really well. Um, we're friends. He, I, I uh, released a book last year and there's a picture of him holding up my book when I, on my uh, launch day, just supporting me, put it on social media so people could see it. When I launched my business, Say It With Gratitude, I did a crowdfunding campaign and he made a contribution to that. Um, last year, almost a year ago exactly to this date, I've got two cats. One of my cats, his name is Nomar, named after the baseball player, Nomar Garcia Parra. He actually had to have two teeth pulled. And so, you know, he's 15 years old last year, mm -hmm. getting old. And, you know, as pet owners, we don't like when our pet has to go in for surgery or be nope. put to sleep. So I went, I dropped my cat off. I went to Fluid, the coffee shop that I'm talking about. And uh, I told the, the barista that was helping me, her name was Coley, is like, Hey, my cat had to have two teeth pulled a little bit down today. I'm a little bit worried. Just coincidentally, she had a cat getting a tooth pulled that very same day. So she kind of made me feel better by telling me that. And she just said, coffee is on the house today. I didn't have to pay for it. And she didn't have to do that. But treating me as a person, um, she did that with a smile. And it makes me feel good. It makes me want to go back there. It makes me want to talk about them. And when you do good things like that as a business, people will talk about you. You don't have to go and, and do all the hard selling yourself because your customers and your clients, they'll speak that for you on social mm -hmm. media or to their friends. And yeah. so those are kind of the leading with gratitude and appreciation in the workplace. Those are two big topics of how gratitude can help a business's bottom line for sure. Yeah, and there's a lot of businesses that can learn from that, uh, sp uh, specifically in the industrial. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we get a lot of the businesses that deal with like food service or actually dealing with the community or people on a day in, day out basis, they get it. They know that they have to teach their employees that, hey, you've got to be grateful for the people coming in here. That, uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have a job. Right. And so I think they get it, but I think in the industrial environment, which what I work in, I mean, I work in mechanical engineering and, and machining field. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly working on computers, drafting, doing stuff like that. And we don't interact with people. We interact with other engineering nerds like us. <laughs> and so you guys have hearts <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I have yet to find it in some people, <laughs> but we, the, the way that people interact with at the business, I think that needs to change with the way like corporate, because mm. I work for one of the largest chemical manufacturing companies in the world. So all of us out there working, we're just numbers to corporate. Mm. And so I've, I've touched on this before about how, how they need to actually learn to start connecting with their employees as human beings, because I've pointed it out before, I have one of the highest turnaround rates in certain departments. Why is that? Because your employees you don't feel like over rates. Huh? Yeah. T highest turnover rates you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Like certain departments have some of the highest turnover rates in there. They're literally to the point where they actually have a contractor who just brings new people in daily. Yeah, I find corporate, like, I think a lot of the time for them, it is the bottom line. And they mm -hmm. need to understand that when you don't treat your team with heart, then you're going to have this turnover, which costs you a lot of money. Oh, yeah. 
I've and tried they, to point that out several times. It's like, yeah. look, you start treating them a little better. Yeah, and pay them more. Pay them right. what they deserve because you're mm -hmm. paying the other people this. I said, and stop treating them like they're a contractor. I mean, that's pretty much what it is. I said, yeah. and and they were like, well, the with the turnover rate, people going in and out, it's costing us money. I said, how much is it costing you having new people come in every day? I said, you think about that. I said, every one of these individuals that comes into this plant to work here has to spend two days going through safety and OSHA training. Now, what if you only had to do that once? Yep. Because you treat him right and he's going to stay. Yep. But no, now you're having to do it almost on a daily basis to replenish the staff because they're, they're like, man, I don't want to work here. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and I know one of kind of, in my experience, there was a, um, a golf, like a, uh, golf resort company mm -hmm. here you know, locally hired me to speak about gratitude in the workplace. And some of the team was already implementing what I was going to talk about, but the higher ups weren't buying in. And so they were like, well, maybe we just need a, like an outside voice. And unfortunately that's sometimes what it takes is like an outside voice needs to come in and talk about it, even though some team members were already saying what I was teaching that day yeah. I came in. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it needs to start at the top, but if it, I believe if the top doesn't buy in, then the rest of the team, they can potentially at least kind of lead by example. Like, okay, they don't buy in, we're gonna do our best to lead with gratitude and whatever we decide that that looks like for our situation, we're just gonna do it. We'll make each other feel good and treat each other as humans and value each other. And, See, and it wasn't always like that out there. And yeah. I've actually mentioned that to people that are new and I've tried to talk to people that have been out there for years. I'm like, you know, it wasn't always like this here. We used to have corporate cups where mm. we'd, build teams and we'd do sporting events with each other. We had family days out there where we'd Love do that. barbecues yeah. and stuff like that. Nothing. We don't do any of that anymore. Gosh, if you could bring that back in, the morale I've, would go up. I've tried. I've tried to yeah. talk about it. I, I interviewed a gentleman. That's what he does as he goes to corporations and tries to do team building like yes. that. And he was like, I can't even get my foot in the door out there. Oh, he was trying to get his foot in the door in the, your company. Okay. Yeah. And he was like, they just, they don't want it right now. And I was like, yeah, yeah was, we used to have a blast 10, 15 years ago. Right. Now it's kind of like, mm. Why do you think they don't like to do that? It's money. So they think well, we're going to have to pay money to do oh. this and we're going to lose money. Yeah, they, they it's, you, you have to, I don't want to sound like I'm stereotyping here, but it's an Asian owned company. Okay. And. I've worked with uh, I've worked with different ethnic groups throughout the year, and it's a different mentality, because the people that own this company aren't from America. They want it run like a company would be run in China or oh, Taiwan you. or something. Sure. Like that. It's a totally different totally dynamic. Different. Yep. They're done, and American employees don't work like that. Well, soon it seems so like I stereotyped Asian communities and Americans at the same yeah. time. Yeah. But it, it was, that was, and that's pretty much what it is, is uh, a lot of it has to do with cultural. It's a cultural mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. It's a conflict of two different cultures and, and finances mm -hmm. is what eventually got, because now they see it as, oh, well, this is money going out and where's the product? What are we going to get back for this? Yeah. They're just out playing baseball. Need to get rid of this. <laughs> well in, in this day and age where word spreads so fast right it mm -hmm. potentially can catch up with them because as you get have so much employee turnover now there are sites like Glassdoor where you can as an employee you can review what is it like to work for this company if they have if they get enough people saying negative things about the company it might potentially be hard to it might potentially be harder to fill those spots in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we're already seeing it. 
You're already seeing it, okay. Yeah, we're already starting. I, I've noticed we're already starting to see it. Well, I hope there's some changes for you guys. <laughs> people in other communities and they're like, oh, you work there. Oh, right, okay. And I'm like, yeah, I've been here though forever. And I don't deal with what everybody else deals with. Mm -hmm. I've got my own room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, there's nobody that works in there with me. I'm in there right. by myself with my computers, tablet, my, all my stuff. I'm good. <laughs> podcast on that's my yeah. day i'm rocking and rolling <laughs> nice you got your own system yeah and, and when and then somebody will come in my room i've actually had somebody walk in my office area in my room and then i didn't even know this room was here <laughs> Shh, you never saw it Lee. yeah right don't tell anybody i'm in here <laughs> i am not the droid you were looking for <laughs> but uh, yeah it so I don't get to actually experience a lot of what goes on on the floor out there, but I talk to people. I know the people. You hear it, yeah. And because they're in my communities. Sure. And running a podcast, people, for some reason, talk to me. <laughs> that's good, though. <laughs> yeah, I guess if I want content, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah, it, that that is a good thing that you're doing, though, with companies. and. and now, and I'm assuming that these are some like smaller scaled down companies that you're working with. Yeah, like for example, why I, I mentioned it would probably be difficult to do like a multi billion dollar corporation that spans over a 20 mile complex. Yeah, but so yeah, like I mentioned, I've spoken. The last two places I've spoken have actually been state healthcare associations conferences. That are in okay. Country. So I've, yeah, so I've gotten in front of a lot of audience that. Um, that are caregivers they serve they're nurses they work with assisted living centers where did you have your conference at um so i've spoken at green bay uh just in back in april uh at the wisconsin healthcare association and wisconsin okay. center of assisted, assisted living and then just most recently in boise idaho I okay spoke, i was I wondering because my wife has gone to several of those conferences before okay because she's a nurse uh, oh, what state are you in again? Mike? I'm in Texas. In Texas. Okay. Well, maybe I'll be invited to speak at the Texas Healthcare Association. Well, if you do, make sure you, you schedule it for <laughs> in October. Yeah. Because well, I'm actually coming to Dallas. Uh, what part of Texas are you in? I'm in South Texas. Okay. I live right I, by the water. Nice. I used to live in Dallas and I'm coming to Dallas in November for well, a conference. It is stupid hot right yes. now. Yes. I don't miss that humidity. Um, I've spent some time in Denver too. I've enjoyed, I enjoyed my little bit yeah. of stay in Denver. <laughs> there was a, uh, I, was, I can't remember the name of it. There was a restaurant there that I went and ate at. And I remember them specifically because they, they, their biggest thing was tea. They served tea. Tea. Okay. And it's like every wall that you saw a pillar in the room had like the, the Republic of tea cans. Oh, wow. All, all around it and i can't remember the name I'm of the not, restaurant i'm it not was familiar like, with that one it was like a thai restaurant or something a beautiful place yeah. but they had just like every possible tea you could think of in this place okay and uh was it was that denver or boulder i've been all over the place i can't remember yeah. where i'm at half the time yeah i don't know which one that was but um i oh, so yeah, it was in boulder it was in boulder, boulder. colorado because i flew yeah. out of denver okay boulder's beautiful so I, anyway, I speak in front of a lot of organizations that serve. If mm -hmm. they, if, so they have, they have patients or residents or customers or clients. And so they're actually getting out in front of people. And uh, I'm, yeah, so I'm speaking. Um, so in, like in November, I'm speaking in Dallas in front of fitness business owners. So fitness owners that, of course, have clients. Um, oh, yeah. That must I'm, I'm going to be speaking next February uh, at this Fleet Wash Academy. So these people have like power washing businesses and um, just really ran. Some of these are random, like I'm in the fitness industry, so that's not as random, but kind of getting in front of these uh, caregivers and uh, this Fleet Wash Academy, it's kind of random. And I'm starting to realize, you know, like kind of like how everybody needs fitness 
I'm kind of realizing everybody needs gratitude at work, you oh, know, especially not all, in the caregiving business. Yes. Because uh, they pour themselves out to others and they don't often get the, get it themselves yeah. and they need that. They need it. Yeah. Cause they've devoted their life to giving. Yes. And even, even some of the residents you learn, if you were talking about like nursing homes and things of that nature, uh, some of the residents need it too. Mm -hmm. Because they've been, they're in a facility, they're away from their families mm -hmm. and they need to be, they need to know that they are still important to somebody. And my wife came home one time and she was like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, well, what's the problem? She goes, we've got a resident who just recently got there. And she said he has no family and he's just down in the dumps all the time. And I went, okay. And she goes, I just don't know what to do. I said, well, do me a favor. And she goes, what's that? I said, when you see him tomorrow, cause you're going in tomorrow. And she goes, yeah. I said, ask him if he plays chess. And she was like, what? And I said, ask him if he plays chess. I'll go up there on Sunday and play chess with him. So awesome. it's and just, did he? Hmm? Did he no, he didn't play chess. We didn't okay. play cards. <laughs> Well, that's good though. Yeah, they like it goes back to they want to be seen, they want to be heard, and um, um, one important thing, um, like as we're talking about caregivers and people that serve and give, and what I try to to the message I try to get across to them is gratitude starts within first, mm -hmm. and so you really need to take care of yourself as hard as it may be, as caretakers, as moms, right. We like to, they like to, not they like to, but they put themselves last because they're so in that giving mindset. They want to give to their kids. They want to give yeah. to their spouses. They want to give to their patients. But if you don't take care of yourself first, you don't have the capacity to give to your optimum level. And the analogy I like to use is when you're about to take off on an airplane, and the flight attendant gives the safety instructions, she or he will say, in the event of an emergency, should the oxygen mask fall down, put it on yourself first before assisting others. Mm -hmm. And as caregivers and really anybody, uh, but those that, were, that do give for a living, uh, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. And so I talked about how gratitude needs to come from within. Um, and you need to live in gratitude before you can give it to others. Because if you just think about like, if you're complaining and you're pessimistic and you live in a negative mindset, how can you be expected to care for your residents or your clients or your team, your employees, the best way possible if you're living in that mindset? So get in your own grateful mindset first yeah. and then you can fully give it to others. That ties in perfectly with the attitudes I was talking about because mm. your attitude reflects. Mm. And I've, I've said this numerous times. If you have a bad attitude about things, you can just walk into a room. People 30 feet away from you can just look at you and your bad attitude's already rubbing off on them. They yes. know that you're in that. But if you come in and you're happy and you have a great attitude, it, you just like your glow. It, it just has this aura about you or you, I don't know if you want to call it psychically hitting people with your gratitude, smacking them down, <laughs> right. but it, it does affect people. And sometimes it's something as simple as a, Hey, how you doing? Or mm -hmm. Hey, thanks for doing that for me. Yes. Gratitude uh, can it's, come it's in. A, simple. Yeah. It can come in a number of different ways. If you, uh, you know, if writing cards, isn't your thing, smile at somebody you know that's what i felt as soon as i stepped off the bus in in guatemala i got those smiles mm -hmm. i got the good morning i got the hug whatever the case may be i mentioned that i really got sensitive and aware that back here in america we often are looking down or looking on our phones will you be the person to smile first that's yeah. an easy way to share gratitude and Something like smiling or keeping a gratitude journal or writing a card, that's going to make you feel good too. So that's part of starting from within. When you smile, 
or when you express gratitude, you can't really express gratitude and be in a complaining mindset at the same time. I, I, into, I tried yeah. to use this with my daughter. My daughter uh, has uh, autism and we've talked about it on the show. So I'm not saying mm -hmm. anything nobody hasn't heard before. She's high spectrum autism and she's, has suffered from uh, anxiety, depression, and she was bullied in school. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've talked to her about is journaling, you know, and it's like, I told her, I said, you had a bad day, write it down. Say I had a bad day, but this is what positive happened today. Yeah. I said, you start listing the positive things and they make that bad day really look like nothing. Mm -hmm. Even if it's one thing, mom gave me a hug that was positive. I mean, just, but I told, and that's one of the things I've always tried to tell her is look for the positive in life. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, cause she will, you know how people are that are, that suffer from depression and anxiety. They always want to focus in on the negative. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tracy Maxfield, one of the, one of the uh, people, I love her dearly. I had her on the show. She, uh, she's written a book on called Ch uh, escaping the rabbit hole and it's about suicide prevention and the anti-bullying and depression, anxiety. And that is one of the things she talks about is people that once they get in this funk, it is so hard for them to get out of it because they have what they call what she called ants, automatic negative thoughts. And you let one ant in and the rest follow. So you have to catch it before it gets, you know, you identify, Oh, Nope. I'm having ants. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, have I heard her say that? Nope. That's an ant. <laughs> that's funny. And just to kind of expand on that and writing down the positives, you know, uh, a buddy of mine that um, his name is Yasmin Nguyen. He's uh, the, oh, well, he's got this movement he's right in the middle of called the joyful living project. And he's traveling. He's on an 18 month journey traveling all across the country, doing acts of kindness and uh, connecting with people. Really cool. Mm -hmm. What he's doing. Uh, I spoke to him and he, uh, he talks about this uh, kick-ass jar where he says, just get a jar. And kind of like what you said, uh, we often focus on the negatives. We could have one, bad thing in our day and 10 good things. And we focus on that one bad thing. So Yasmin says, keep a, a kick-ass jar is what he calls it. could be a wins jar. And whenever something cool happens during your day, you write it down on a slip of paper and you put it in the jar. And it could be, you know, like uh, you had, I had lunch with dad, put it in the jar. I right? exercise today, put it in the jar, whatever. Just fill up the jar with all these positive wins, right? And then when you really, like you mentioned your daughter, I had a bad day. Go in and get that kick-ass jar and remind yourself, maybe pick out four or five of those slips and remind yourself of all the good things that are still happening in your life. Mm -hmm. and, just, and that'll just really help you focus on those. So I really love uh, what Yasmin talks about and just keep in a jar and slips the paper in there and that'll just remind you of the good yeah. in life. Yeah, just give it's that extra boost you need you know, like mm -hmm. with your journal. I mean, you can go back and reread it and say, Hey, yeah, I look, I had a bad day this day too, but it was actually a pretty good day altogether. Yep. And, yep. and this day is going to be that way too. Yeah. Mike, and speaking of journals, like when I, I'll teach some people how to take their journaling a little bit deeper. And so I know some people that keep a gratitude journal, they're kind of just go through the motions. It might be a prompt, like what are three things you're grateful for today? Uh, my health, my job, my dog, flip the page. What are three things you're grateful for today? And it's really just like a more of a mindless exercise. So what I suggest to take it a little bit deeper to start living in more gratitude is say why you're grateful for those things. Yeah. So, I'm grateful for my mom. Why are you grateful for your mom? And then you start to list the reasons and you're like, wow, I have a really awesome There is mom. actually an app on the iPhone. Okay. A gratitude app. And What's it that called? That. I don't remember. I saw it just the okay. other day. I was, uh, I was looking for a planner. I have an Android off to see if it's on that. Yeah. Well, I, I had an Android up until this year, but okay. I was on the, I, I, I was trying over. to, 
Uh, yeah, here's my. You black got rid of the BlackBerry. <laughs> well, here's my BlackBerry. I still have oh. it. It quit working in my area, so I had to go to a different phone. Palm Pilot, remember that? Uh, and I used uh, the app I used was Pocket Informant. Okay. A great scheduling app. It, it worked across all my platforms, and I was like, okay, now I need something because I got a stupid iPhone now. <laughs> so I was looking for it, and I was like, oh, Pocket Informant has an iPhone app. $45 a year. And I'm like, what? No, I'm not paying for that. So I was flipping through all the different planners and stuff. And I saw that on there it was a gratitude app okay. and you click on it. And every day when you open it up, it gives you some things, some prompts and prompts. Yeah. And you fill it in. I wonder and if that's you, the one I have, cause I do have one called gratitude three, six, five. I think it's that sounds familiar. That may be okay. it. That may be cause that has prompts each day. Yeah. It prompts you each day. It sends you notification like, Hey, this is what's going on. It gives you a little positive quote or something like yes, that. Yes, yes. Like, I think oh, that's, that's it. That's cool. Oh, yep. so I, you were mentioning that and I was like, oh yeah, I think I saw that this last weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those are really good. And these apps are mm -hmm. good to have. Mm -hmm. Like like we said, we're living in an age of technology. Everybody carries around their phone. Nobody leaves home without their phone. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't leave home without my travel journal. I've got a leather bound travel journal that I carry hey, with me. So old school handwriting. Old in it, school. Right? I carry yeah. it with me everywhere. That's good. And uh, it's, uh, uh, one day when I'm dead and gone, my kids are going to be going through my office and they're going to find all these inserts to it. <laughs> so uh, Mike, I run these adventure trips and a woman that's been on a few of the trips, she's in her seventies. And she, her husband passed away a few years ago. So she travels a lot alone across the country. She likes to drive. So mm -hmm. she drives more than she flies. And uh, she prefers a paper map. She doesn't use a GPS. She uses a paper map. She likes to take not the main highways. Yeah. She likes to take the lesser traveled roads and she'll do it with a paper map. And she, I, she's in I've her own world. Past. Awesome, huh? I've done that yeah. in the past. Uh, we used to, uh, I used to live in Savannah, Georgia. And nice. uh, so we would drive from Savannah, Georgia back to Texas to visit with the family. And so we had the kids with us in the back seat one day and we're, uh, we were on our way back to Georgia and uh, going I-10 through Louisiana. It branches off I-10 to I-12. If you stay on I-10, you carry on over going to Alabama, Mobile and all that. But if you hit the I-12, it takes you down to New Orleans. Okay. <laughs> so we were about two miles away from that intersection. And I just looked in the rearview mirror and I said, hey, guys. And then what? I said, right or left? <laughs> and they were like, what? And I said, right or left? Better make it quick. We so got to up on it. And I don't want to go straight. <laughs> and so they were like, uh, right. Okay, great. So we ended up going through New Orleans, down through the French Quarter. <laughs> oh, this is something they've never seen before. That's awesome. And that's kind of how we did the whole trip back home. It was like, hey, we're going to do this. Y'all want to do this? And they're like, yeah. So it was like, surprise visit to the Stennis Space Center. <laughs> <laughs> it's closed today. That's all right. We can walk around outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I like when we can use things like journals and handwritten cards, but I mean, I rely so much on GPS. I don't know. I get lost without it. I was like, how did I do this 10 years ago when I didn't have GPS, man? Oh, man. <laughs> I used to carry around a thick atlas, one of those uh, road atlases. Oh, yeah. I to all 48 United, uh, states in the continental U.S. Uh -huh. and so I drove everywhere. All right. So I, I know how to use one of those pretty proficiently, but you couldn't make me use one now. <laughs> Yeah. I remember before taking long drives, we would, my dad and I, we'd go to like AAA and they would provide like the triptych, which was a whole map. And we just highlight yeah, the, highlight. the route we were going to go. I'm like, all right. And, I guess, and then we started I guess the getting lazy. Map. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> quest. Yeah. Then I would get the directions on my computer and just print them out. I have like mm -hmm. 10 pages of directions here. And, just and then GPS on the phone. Get to the intersection. Yeah, right. <laughs> Now GPS on the phone. <laughs> like, all right, I'm going one mile. Let me map it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally do that because my wife will, I need you to go pick this up. Where is this store? Yeah. <laughs> and now I'll be like, let me, let me Google it. There it is right there. 
It's awful. I'll be like, I know where to go now, but I'll still do the GPS to, to see if how bad the traffic is and mm-hmm. all that stuff. So well, that's our connectivity. Yep. In a way is. it's good. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. some technology that's good for sure. But like I said, I like my travel journal because <laughs> I can, it, it's the aesthetics of it. Yeah. Writing in it. Yep. Just like, uh, and you can see what you've accomplished. Too. Yeah. And it's just like doing my artwork that I do. My, mm-hmm. uh, cause I hand carve in wood. Oh, nice. Okay. And so Very cool. I enjoy doing that. My painting that I do, you see a green screen behind me, but I actually do, yeah. that's a whole nother part of a room on the opposite side of me. That's, uh, that's all woodwork. Oh, you tricked me. Look at yeah, that. That's, that's, that's awesome. My, my art. This is my art slash recording studio all at the same time. Hey, just, art goes down the middle of the room. Art's a great creative outlet. It's, and, it'll get you mindful, right? Yeah, I mean, it's some of the stuff I've done. I mean, it, that's part of my disconnecting. And that's mm-hmm. where I think a lot of us have to step back and disconnect from the phones, from the technology, from the world, so we can work on ourselves, like you said. Uh, reminds me of a book that I recently, uh, I got it on Audible. It's called The Three Day Effect. And it was disconnecting from all technology and just going and spending three days in the wilderness. Mm, Huge. And it's amazing what it does to the brain, the biofeedback, everything that you get in the brain. Uh, And the experiment was run with veterans that were suffering from PTSD. Yes. Yeah, and I I just, Outside Magazine just, shared a story about that recently Uh, do you have an audible account uh i don't but i should get one because my book is about to be launched on audible so maybe (laughs) i should get one yeah if you get one it's it's a uh if you get if you have an audible account every month you get a free book okay plus you get two audible originals okay for free and this three-day effect was an audible original okay and about four hours to listen to it Yep. But they went through the whole science of it, the process, and you were actually hearing, it wasn't really a, it wasn't really a, like a book, but you were also hearing the interviews. Oh, were, okay. They were interviewing her and they were, you could hear the, the birds outside. That's awesome. Oh, cool. And they talked to one of the veterans uh, prior to his going on this trip. She asked, she tried to get him to go on it the first time. And he was like, nope, don't want to do it. That's outside. I want to have nothing to do with that. I'm done with being outside. There's nothing out there. Everything out there wants to kill me. Mm. So he wouldn't do it. Well, she finally talked him into doing it. And this guy was suicidal. He had been on all kinds of medications, antidepressant meds and all this stuff. Got him out into the wilderness. They had a scientist with them who uh, in the evening would put electrodes on them, measure their brain waves and all this stuff and give them some just small tasks to do. Mm-hmm. One of them was reading from a book that was in Sanskrit. They had no idea what they were reading but they could pronunciate the words, had no idea. <laughs> Day one, they stumbled through this book. I was trying to read it. By the end of the third day, their brain waves had come to like, like they said from being sporadic all over the place to just mellow. Mm. He'd give them a simple task, read this book. And it was like, they'd hold it in their hands and read it like they were reading a Shakespeare play. Awesome. <laughs> there was nothing to it. The gentleman that she took with her that did not want to go on this trip, when he got home, he had a chance to disconnect and just absorb nature and get out of himself and just live. Uh, He was able to come off of his medications after that, and he now makes it a point once a month to do three days out in the wilderness. Wow, that's awesome. I love it. I love it. I'm a big believer in that. My, I, I mentioned I run adventure trips. We do them unplugged. Mm-hmm. Uh, I take away everybody's phones as soon as they get there. Ah! And, and we spend <laughs> the week, you know, we spend the week out in nature. Um, just whatever, whitewater rafting, zip lining, hiking, um, volunteering. And it's just, it's tough. The first night, you know, people like, they're so addicted to their phones. It's almost like a withdrawal. Yeah. Um, by the end, they're like, I don't really want, this felt great. I don't want my phone back. I'm scared to turn it on and get all these notifications. And, and then that's when you tell them, hey, guess what? You can turn all those off. Them, yes. And so there are ways to disconnect without 
fully <laughs> unplugging by doing things like you know, putting your phone on airplane mode when you go to sleep or getting rid of apps you don't use or like you mentioned, turning off notifications. Just try those things. I'm reading a book um, called How to Break Up With Your Phone in 30 Days. It's called something like that. <laughs> and it gives you like one action step to do each day. I can Just give like you that. one action step right now that will that'll help you break up with your phone in 30 days. Yes. Buy a flip phone. Oh, <laughs> Yep, you're like, what is this? How, wait, how do we text? We have to type in three times <laughs> to get T9. like the C. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to really want to send that text. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. But uh, yeah, that's just personally, I'm interested in being mm -hmm. disconnected more personally, and it just and getting I out did, in nature. I did that. Uh, it was about oh shoot, it's going on about a year now. Uh, I was at work and I had my phone sitting over on like a totally different area of my, of my desk and I was doing something and I heard that ping hmm. and it was the Facebook one and I started to reach for it and I went, whoa, what am I doing? This project that I was working on was extremely critical. Mess it up. Somebody could die literally. And oh, I was like, what okay. am I doing? And I was sitting there and I had to sit back and I just went, oh my word, I just had a Pavlovian response. Mm -hmm. I'm the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all are. You're not alone. So I like, yeah. So I turned the notifications off for all social media. Mm. Uh, I, the only, the only thing I left, so the, uh, the only thing I left on as far as notification wise was my text messages because my kids text message me if there's something wrong during the day mm -hmm. or my wife does. And I left messenger on because I've got friends that don't have my phone number that if they need something, they contact me through messenger. As far as so-and-so posted this picture, I don't need to know that right now. Right. It's not an emergency guys. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> going to die. If I don't, you are not going to die. If I don't like your picture immediately. Yeah. You can get it when I like it at nine o'clock tonight. And the, unfortunately, we've, I think we, we're living in an age where we begin to expect immediate responses. Yeah. And if somebody doesn't reply back in 10 minutes, what, like, what happened? Why didn't you reply? And we start, then we start questioning ourselves. Is it something I said? And like, it goes, it can go, it can spiral your mindset. Absolutely. Like, uh, I didn't get any likes on this. Why? Do what people did I don't do like wrong? me? Yeah. And that it can, it can be very dangerous. Yeah. It, it, <clears throat> and see, and I'm fortunate enough to where I live at, I live out in the country mm -hmm. and the company I work for is five miles down the road. So it's out in the country. I have no signal hardly at all half the time. So I don't have to worry about it. My wife will send me a message during the day. I might get it around, one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> right. And then I'll get home. Well, you didn't feel like texting me back. <laughs> <laughs> it just came through, guy. Yeah, Mom. it's like so she understands right. now, but it, it took a little while at first. But yeah, we disconnected that because now I don't have to worry about. I've turned off the notifications, so I don't have to worry about Facebook or Instagram or Twitter bothering me. And there were several apps that I just. I went on my phone and went, I don't need this anymore. I don't need this mm -hmm. anymore. Just flipped them off. Uh, specifically right now, especially with what's going on in politics. I know all I'm going to do is get angry if I start reading the news. Yep. So <laughs> I turned off the news feeds. Because it's yep. like every, it was, every few minutes, something's going happening. Somebody's mad about this. Somebody said something. So... And then mm -hmm. somebody pushes it over to me. Hey, what do you think about this? Because I like to debate. I use, I, I debate mm -hmm. a lot. I part people on the show and debate them. And then finally I got to the point where I, was like, <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I said, my nerves are so freaking shot from having to yeah. defend certain positions or defend people, certain people. And it's like, uh, -uh no more done. Turn it off. I'm done with politics. Yeah. We yeah got and it. when you are plugged in, when you are plugged into all of those things, right, it can affect your personal relationships, 
your work, your creativity, it can affect all those, your sleep, your energy, whether you exercise, it really, yeah, your mindset, it's a whole, um, whole host of things that can go wrong if you engage in all those things. So yeah, it's disconnect. We need to disconnect. Just be one with ourselves at first, get to know ourselves, Mm -hmm. get to love ourselves and just be grateful. I guess that we're here, we're breathing. Mm -hmm. Breathe in, breathe out. That's what I always tell (laughs) my daughter. That's the first thing I tell her when she comes to me in a panic or something, stop, breathe in. Now breathe out. Now let's go over this. (laughs) I love that. I go through a guided meditation. One of them says, uh, every breath is a miracle. And if you really think about that, that's so true. And just keep that in mind when Uh, you're going through things. uh, The, uh, oh, I can't remember what app it was. Calm or insight timer or headspace. Uh, Qui-Gon, Qui-Gon meditation. Okay. I may use that one. It's actually really good because it'll actually has it'll guide you through certain ones, but then it'll actually have like you'll hear the wind chimes in the background. Oh yeah, and stuff like that, and then you get it'll give you like little mantras or something to go through, and those work really good. Um, I actually broke down at one time and bought a, a set of Tibetan prayer beads because using them during meditation, you roll them through your fingers. And for each yeah. beat, you're supposed to have a mantra of what you're grateful for. Well, there's 81 beats it. on this strand, so that's 81 <laughs> things you're going to be okay. grateful for. And that's so, good. I, we have more than that. <laughs> it's like, hey, guess what? Uh, they make strands that are longer. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, it's yeah. Just those types of things. And then uh, one of the gentlemen that I know, uh, his name is Sam Harris. He's actually releasing a meditation app. He's been, he's a, uh, uh, he's a neuroscientist and he's been studying the effects of what meditation does on the human brain. Mm. And he's actually got an app uh, for uh, meditation now. Nice. And Audible also has a whole section on meditation. They're part of the Audible originals. Well, if you have uh, an affiliate link, send it to me. Uh, it's I can just sign on up Audible. underneath it. Yeah, okay. I don't have an affiliate link for Audible, but <laughs> we're running up on time for us to get off. So here's what we are going to do, though. I want, right. people, I want you to tell everybody how they can get in touch with you. And all these links will also be on the show details. So it'll be there in type and print for those who forget. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so email is scott at scottcolby.com. So that's pretty easy. My website is Say It With Gratitude, sayitwithgratitude.com. And then as far as social media, as we have told you to disconnect, but to make authentic relationship with me, you can definitely message me through um, Facebook. So my Facebook uh, personal page is just facebook.com forward slash Scott Colby. And then I have a Say It With Gratitude page yeah. on there as well. And connect with me. would love to get to know everyone. In all honesty, I love the name of your website. Well, thank you. Uh, say it with gratitude. And I was sitting there thinking, I was like, you're not going to forget that. No. Because I, I a, a lot of times I have to open up my notes. I'm like, all right, what was there? And it's something weird. And I was like, I got to find his website. Oh, say it with gratitude. Okay, that's simple enough. Yeah, it was a little play on say it with attitude. Uh, I've got I a friend. That. I've got a friend and she basically comes up with every name, every good name. like. Oh, the grateful entrepreneur. That should be your book title. I was like, done. And I was like, I have my book. And yeah. so she's really good at naming things. So I give my, her my books weren't that type of books. Uh, <laughs> mine were horror. Oh yeah, horror. Yeah. I, I, I write in the horror. I know you're in that space. Yeah, I saw some of those. Yeah. Um, everybody's always like, oh, you're an and and I do these type of shows. And yeah. I do I do another show. It's the After Dark series. Where After Dark. I saw that. Stuff, right. <laughs> And they're like, but all these people you're interviewing and, and what are you, uh, send me a link to your book. And I'm like, no, you don't want a link to my, and I've had people that I've interviewed. It was like, it's like uh, Devro. She was so sweet. 
but she teaches women on careers and stuff like this. Oh, send me a link to your book. And I'm like, no, you don't want a link to my book. It's my alter ego. <laughs> and she's like, well, why? Well, you do the, and I said, that's not what my book's about. Like, what kind of writer are you? So I'm a horror writer. I said, my wife tried to be an editor for one of my books. She handed it back to me after one chapter. So I can't do this. <laughs> She said, that's bad. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, well, you married me. So I'm what like, does that say? We've been together 24 years now and you're just now figuring <laughs> this out. Uh, it's awesome. But, yeah, yeah, it's a horror genre. So, <laughs> all right, well, let's wrap this up. Ed, to all my listeners, guys, if you need to get a hold of me, again, at stalkermailbox at gmail.com or you can call our phone number and that's being blocked by my lamp over there. It's a 361-433-5739. And you can leave a three-minute message if you something you want to talk about is a little longer. Just call back in and continue your story. We'll edit it and post if we're going to play it on the air. Uh, and once again, look, if you need to get a hold of Scott, I'm going to have his information in the details and show notes. And just go to his website. It's great because there's pictures there. You'll get to see the the expressions on the faces of the people in the communities that he's been working with in Guatemala and stuff. And it's just, you can tell that they appreciate the fact that he was there to do something for them. And it was, it's basically like the website says, just say it with gratitude. Hmm. So awesome. with that guys, I think we're going to go ahead and I got no better way to wrap it up. Scott, do you want to have any final closing you want to say? No, just thank you for having me. I'm grateful for you and your audience. I mean, I love, this is my favorite topic to talk about and I love that I got to, use your platform and share with your audience to spread this message. The more we can spread gratitude, I think the, the better everybody's better life will be. be yes. Get everybody out of this funk. Yes. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. No problem. Well, everybody, that's going to be it for tonight. And uh, once again, hook, uh, look us up on iTunes, Google play, wherever it is that you get your podcast from like the show, subscribe to it, tell a friend, it helps us out. And with that, we're out of here, guys. Now, here comes the music. We want to thank you for tuning in to the Anything Goes Project. If you like this show, subscribe and share it. That would greatly help us out. To contact the show, email us at stalkermailbox at gmail.com. We love hearing from our subscribers and our listeners. The Anything Goes Project can be found on iTunes, CastBox, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn, and many other Android applications. And once again, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.